Now, Jam, I'm keen to hear your thoughts. I'm confident that we will get lots of inspirations from you, how money, markets, and values could somehow be commonified. Now, please welcome with me Professor Jam Bendel. You have 30 minutes. working. Can you hear me? Yes, you can. Good. Yes, thank you, Ludwig and Silke, for the invitation. Uh, when I got the invitation, I knew that because of the connection with the Peter P Foundation, you would be a phenomenal group of people, and in fact, a really daunting group of people to keynote to. So just to calm me down before I got on stage, I met uh, Wolfgang Sachs, um, the guru for me when I was at Cambridge uh, 20 years ago. Um, uh, he wrote some of the most important books uh, that, I, that I read during my geography degree. Uh, and at the time, another Sachs was off privatizing Russia. I think the UN actually got their wires crossed and started listening to the wrong, the wrong Sachs. So I'm um, very a big pleasure t to meet you indeed. Um, I, sh I'm, I don't work on the commons as such, so this has been a real fascinating journey and it continues for me right now. Uh, commons economics is something I've only really started looking at. But one thing I should say, which I've got from working as sort of a, an action-oriented intellectual or academic, is we must be careful not to thingify. Now, that's a word for the translators. Thingify. I think Martin Luther King came up with it. Uh, he said, we thingify everything, and, and, and including people. But for me, we need to be careful about that with the commons. And we maybe need to make sure we, we have some systems thinking. Uh, so, so for me, a commons is a system of relationships between people and phenomena, we could say resources, um, that has an emergent property of sustained sufficient access for all. And we can... And it's important to play with definitions and see whether they're weak or where they lead us or where they don't. But, but for me, that's the impression I'm getting anyway at, at the moment. And I think it's important to keep in mind because... And this conference is so important because at the moment, the sharing economy, P2P, collaborative consumption, this is an incredibly feel-good space, which is very atheoretical, very apolitical... Uh, very ahistoric, ahistorical, and I think there's a lack because of that. So I think this conference, by bringing up questions around, you know, looking at history, looking at theory, looking at political dimensions, is essential. So why consider money if we're considering the commons? Ludwig said a couple of things about that. Um, I'm going to say a couple of words on that, but... I think three things I want to highlight very quickly at the start, and then I'll return to them. The first one is that our current mainstream monetary system represents an almost total enclosure of our ability to trust each other, with governments, central banks, and private banks working together to create the dominant means of exchange, the dominant way of people issuing credit to each other. It's all done through the banking system. But also this mainstream system drives further enclosure. It works against the commons because of the way the currencies are created, the way the credit's created. And I'm going to return to that more in detail in a moment. But I think a third reason is just because of what's happening right now. There are thousands of people worldwide who are trying very new ways of thinking and, and working with currency and they are inspired by a very collectivist or communal uh, approach to, to life and to economy. So it's where there's a lot of, a lot of uh, innovation, and there's lots of people in the room, I know, who are working on this. But one thing I really thought I should spend a little bit of time on right at the start, just to make sure we're all on the same page and therefore all can engage well in the, in the, uh, the coming sessions... Is, is the very nature of money. So most people think, when I talk to them, that money really isn't an issue. What the issue is, is how we earn it, how we spend it, how we invest it. But they don't really think about where money comes from. Now this, I presume, is a very smart audience. So when I ask for a show of hands, 
you'll know exactly what to do. Who here thinks money grows on trees? Okay, fine, yeah. A couple of very philosophical inspired people there. Um, I'll, let's chat in the bar later. Uh, who thinks uh, money comes from government? Who think that money comes from the central banks? In this case, then, with now we have the European Central Bank, yes. A few hands, a few hands, yep. And a few quizzical looks uh, as well. <laughs> Who thinks... Um, Wolfgang, you haven't put your hand up, have you? No, good. Um, who thinks money comes from the private banking system? Ah, I see. Okay, I can go home now then. Good. So, no, but there's this, that's really interesting to see. So there is this growth in awareness of the monetary world that we live in, which is that in nearly all advanced economies today, it's over 97% of all the money we use is issued by private banks when they, make, when they, when they issue loans. So when we go to a bank and we ask for a loan for whatever it is, it's not savers money that they're lending to us. They're creating new money through extending credit to us. And that process is traditionally understood by most economists through something called the multi money multiplier. But actually the most latest the, the latest research, for example, by the New Economics Foundation in, in a book, Where Does Money Come From? shows that we really have non reserve banking now. So you can just, you, they, the banks can lend as much as they want and then they seek to, to basically make sure they've got enough central bank reserves at the end of a period in order to uh, clear the different transactions between banks. So we have very little control over monetary supply. And this is a dominant system so that you look at the euro and you look at the pound and you look at the dollar and you think that maybe these are different things, but actually they're using the same form, the same mechanism, which is bank-issued debt as the origin of, of the money. So it's almost like you know, if you think that you're buying a Kit Kat rather than a Crunchy bar, they're different when actually it's still Nestle. The, the system behind it is the same. Now, what does that actually mean? Well, more and more people are beginning to ask much deeper questions about what this monetary system means for, for, for life. Um, the first one is, is that collectively together we're all in debt forever because this money is issued with interest. And of course the interest has to be paid with something. So what we have now is, is a case where we have compounding interest means there's more debt than there is money to pay off the debt. So the only way this system continues is if there's ever-increasing loans every year. Some, the some ec economics theoreticians do say that, oh, but if every, every amount of money that, uh, that's earned through interest is then spent back into the economy, then as long as there's enough velocity, then uh, you can actually somehow square that equation. But that's not what happens. Uh, there's a lot of money that's... Prof the profits that are made are then re-lent. So this perpetual indebtedness leads to spiralling inequality. But it also means we need to grow the economy because loans will only be issued if there's additional economic activity to be conducted with those new loans. So this creates a growth imperative, which means the commodification of more of the stuff of life, turn it into a commodity where you can extract a yield, pay, generate profits in order to service the interests on the debt. So this monetary system is anti-commons. With this monetary system, you cannot grow a commons economy. It also, of course, means that there's fluctuating amounts of, of, of money in the system, and so we have boom and busts, and we have, like we do now in many places, mass unemployment, when suddenly there's a shrinkage of the amount of liquidity in an economy. We also see this, this distortion of society or life itself. Most people think, like, many people you speak to is that, well, buying a house is the best investment because prices will always go up. And don't really think about 
why that is. But basically, if spending power is being cre- new spending power is being created by banks in this way, they create this in ways that serve their own interests. So the least transaction costs, uh, the least risk, uh, and the most return. And so what's happened is all this new spending power is basically going into the property market. In the UK, it's about 80% of all loans made to individuals is, is for property. And what this means is, I think, the campaign Positive Money published a statistic that since about the mid-1950s, property prices in the UK have gone up 8,000%. And that's because that's how new spending power is entering the economy. Now, this, we've, we, we heard, I don't know if we've used the word entrapment before, but this, this means that we, we end up with a society and even a sense of what life is like because of the origin of money in this way. So that it costs an arm and a leg in order to rest your head somewhere. You, you know, rents are high or mortgages are high uh, and all the pressures that that creates because of this system. And I hear the property boom is coming to Berlin now as well. So you can now enjoy this. You may end up soon with situations like in the UK where one of the most romantic things you can do is buy a flat together because it means you're locked in for life, really. Um, (laughs) I mean, there must be someone saying, you know, darling, do you want to buy a flat with me? And then maybe we can live happily ever after if we sit at home, watch TV, don't move a muscle so we can afford the mortgage. So <laughs> this, 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 for me, I've come to realize that the monetary system creates all these knock-on effects and even shapes the way we experience life. We end up thinking that, uh, that, that wealth is scarce, that we must all compete because the money is scarce when actually the wealth is us and our ability to do stuff for each other and have and support a healthy environment. Who here is vegetarian? Fantastic, I love you. You're an inspiration to me. I'm almost there. <laughs> and I, I, and, but I, I think I've come to realize that we, all of us, actually live off bank debt. So... Um, unless you're growing your own, everything that arrives on your plate, veg- uh, vegetables, in the end, the transactions were mediated by bank-issued debt. And so you vegetarians, like all of us, are actually bank You live off bank debt, and you p- participate in a society which is, uh, could be called some kind of bank society, a society, a, a totalitarian bank uh, a society of of bank rule. I think a Guardian journalist once called it a bankocracy. Um, It frames everything, and it's so pervasive that people don't see it. People don't even ask the question, where does money come from? So what to do about it? Well, who here uh, works... Who here has an account with some kind of funny money? Look at that. Funny money, alternative, alternative types of currencies. There we go. Quite a few people there. Great. So what's really exciting is that a lot of people in this space have moved from this slightly philosophical critique to actually getting on with doing something about it. Bitcoin has probably done one of the most, uh, the, the, the most to raise awareness in the general public about this. Um, uh, who hasn't heard of Bitcoin See, so there's just a couple of hands going up. Bitcoin is sometimes called a cryptographic currency. It's an entirely entirely digital currency. It's global. Basically, you download a bit of code, and, the, and that's a wallet, and it, pros- it, looks, for, looks, for, um, it looks to mine, uh, basically by calculating algorithms, uh, looks to mine bitcoins, and it provides you with a payment infrastructure worldwide. So it's a currency with no official s- sort of issuer and no banks involved, uh, and it provides anonymity for its users. Uh, it's, it fluctuates massively. There are a lot of people speculating around it. It behaves as if it's a commodity, even though it's entirely virtual. But I think one of the most exciting currencies, because it's so ordinary and has been around for so long, is the one in the middle there. It's called the Veer Bank. The Veer Bank has existed since, I think, 1934 in Switzerland, and it has over 65,000 business members. It does, I think, about 
two billion dollars equivalent worth of trade every year. And what it is, is simply an accounting system between the members on this platform. So that if you're a small business and the cost of a loan to restock your supplies uh, is, is too high, the interest rates are too high, or maybe the bank doesn't want to extend that credit to you, you have another option, which is to uh, borrow in Veer, where one Veer is notionally equivalent to one Swiss franc. And 65,000 other companies in Switzerland will accept it as payment. So it means that just because there's maybe a tightening of the um, credit environment with Swiss francs, it doesn't mean that you stop trading. And that's what, the re- that's what recession is all about. It's not about suddenly we become poor. We have the same skills, same talents, same hopes, same buildings, same climate, maybe. Um, but the monetary, there's a shrinkage in, in money supply. So it, this is a B2B, mutual credit system for, for official terms. Um, another system which is, and I think uh, Susan Vitt is, is here. Are you here, Susan Vitt? Hello, good to meet you. Um, you, you I, th- these are your things up here, are they? The, uh, the Burke shares. So another form of currency, and correct me if I'm wrong, is where uh, an organization then issues a currency which is convertible to some other national currency and is backed by that national currency. And you can do it in certain ways in terms of how, who can redeem it and how and what penalties there might be or a period on the redeemability, maybe even an expiry date. But this is done in a way to encourage people to understand money better, but also to encourage more local trade. There's a, a project that I'm helping a bit with at the top there called the, the Bangla Pesa in Kenya just just started now. And what the Bangla Pesa is about is um, can be called a, a local fiat. Basically, an organization that's trusted by the community is issuing these notes and not actually making it convertible. But they are circulating, they're providing a new medium of exchange. The idea then is to take that online, integrate it with SMS, and turn it into a a, a person-to-person, peer-to-peer mutual credit system. And they're doing that with Community Forge, which is a a tiny NGO that I I help a bit with, and Matthew Slater is the the, uh, co-founder there. Um, Basically now there's about... Um, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, I think there's a, a, over 60 active currencies around the world. These are community currencies, and they use the free open source software that Community Forge provides. And there's about, is it 4,000 tr- uh, members active every month? And so th- this, again, is, is that people can trade with each other without official money. And so they may be cash poor, but it doesn't mean they lack the desire to be useful to each other. Many of you probably have heard of time banks, which, again, is another, another um, form of... Often it's issued in, in a mutual credit way, um, but where one hour is the unit of account. Now, that often is done in a way which is to try and challenge the assumptions of the marketplace and to promote equality. Uh, and so... I think that's a useful thing to note because different currency designs uh, have different motivations and represent different values, but also then have different potential for scaling and for encroaching into the mainstream market space. Um, Ludwig works uh, on a really interesting area where you could have currencies that are issued as promises uh, to deliver future goods and services, for example, kilowatt hours. So you can have uh, companies that produce renewable energy then issuing promises to redeem uh, a kilowatt hour renewable energy. And then that, if you get a sufficient number of companies behind it and people recognizing it, can also then circulate as a currency and also possibly even then fund the kind of uh, economic activity we want to see, such as renewable energy production. What I particularly like about Community Forge and why I think that really relates to the commons is that the philosophy is we need to restore what Tom Greco calls the credit commons. We need to provide opportunities 
for people to trust each other in ways which will enable transactions. So I, the, the amount that I can do for any one of you or you could do for me should not somehow be regulated by decisions made through global banking system that provides the liquidity for us to transact. We can actually come up with systems together for either self-issued credit, like with, with punk money, Eli's here who invented punk money, um, where I, know, I promise to... Well, uh, can you tweet it now? Um, I'll... I, ha I have to do this with the, the founder of Punk Money. Um, um, tweet me something and then I'll, I'll redeem it later. <laughs> or I, I, I don't want to stop, otherwise I'd have to do it here and, and I know you, I should get to the end of my speech. But this is, it's, it's a shift in thinking about how we can issue credits to each other, IOUs to each other. And I think that is, very much, that is currency as commons rather than just currency supporting the commons. Now, when I was thinking about what to talk about today, and I was hearing all the debates last night as well about what is the commons, I was very excited by how this is, a, this is the kind of conversation that needs to happen. As I was saying earlier, the, the, the P2P space, the sharing economy space, is quite a-theoretical, a-historical, a-political. We need to have this conversation. But I'm a bit worried that this whole process, we could end up disappearing up our own asses, really. Because we, in, in so many fields I've worked on, as more money and funding comes into the space, then people end up spending all their time talking to each other, uh, huge you know, essays written and books and chapters, etc., debating the finer points of things. But what we really need to do is better help each other to act and to build the commons. So... With that in mind, and because I've been speaking for 20 minutes, what I want you to do is to turn to your neighbour and ask them, what is it that motivates you to work in support of the commons? Now, if, um, if they say, well, they don't, <laughs> um, then, then maybe you, you have something to share, and then you can say what motivates you to work in the commons. Just do this for a couple of minutes and then I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll, we'll just hear something back from you all. So I'm going to now ask, ra randomly ask, for three words. I hope you are listening well to your colleague, because I'm going to ask you for three words that summarizes the essence of what you've heard of the intention of your conversation partner, Jan. Three words, uh, uh, Jan, three words that summarize what you've just heard as the intention. Silence, please. Let's just get some feedback. Peace and a spiritual component and access to both of those. Peace and s spirituality. A third word? Equal access to those. Okay, and equal access. Who else wants to summarize the essence of what they've just heard? 
uh, well, fair access and uh, future generations, uh, intergeneration justice. Okay. Good, thank you. Social interaction with people. Social interaction with people, almost three words. Okay, any, any, anyone here want to share? Yes, okay. Social justice, equality. Okay, so we've heard of peace, spirituality, justice, um, and so on. Anything down here? Uh, access and public space. Public space and access. So there are... Who, who um, hands up if those are the themes that you either expressed or have just heard yourself and your pairs? Hmm. Don't be shy. Hand. Uh, okay, so I would say half. So there's other stuff that hasn't been shared. In that case, uh, what hasn't been shared? Let's just get some other ideas just to hear the essence of people's intention for working in this field. Who didn't have their hand up? Yes. Talked about people's well-being. That was it. People's well-being. Anything else? Fun. Fun. There we go. Fun. <laughs> Hands up. Who had fun in the yeah, in the conversation? There we go. Okay. So joy, being human, rather than being worried about what's in it for me all the time. Survival as well. Okay. Um, now there's some there's something. There's something very elemental and human and beautiful about why people work on the commons and things that are people working on that are coming here. But I think we've got a problem because um, if we want to really become more of a social movement, we need to learn from social movements of the past. And therefore we need to develop not just the intellectual theories but actually the sense of common identity. Powerful social movements have that sense of shared identity. And of course, we come from all parts of the world as well. So that also poses some challenges for the cultivation of that. But I think it's essential. And therefore, we have a problem. Because in the English language, the word commons is pretty rubbish. I mean, if you're common in England, then you're a bit rough and no one will, you know, um, you're a bit ordinary. Um, Commoning doesn't really, doesn't really, no one uses that language. So we, we have a challenge. We have a, 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 a you know, I work in, in, in a management school. We have a bit of a, a marketing problem. And just because we question the dominant, dominant way of thinking in, in, in markets doesn't mean we can't learn bits and bobs from uh, successful uh, players in the markets. So we need, we, need a, we need a good brand. And in fact, branding came before markets. I mean, you know, the crucifix is pretty pretty important brand. So... <laughs> We, we, what are we? I'm going to make a suggestion, which is that I think that most people, when they talk about the commons, think of enclosure, they think of people worrying about protecting things or holding back progress. I'm not talking about us, the freaks and geeks who know about all this stuff. I'm talking about, you know, people who read The Sun, uh, watch Sky Television, whatever, even the BBC, in fact, those who do watch the BBC. So... We need something more dynamic that reflects how we are actually more focused on restoring the commons and building and creating future commons. And so I thought, well, maybe a term like this, which sort of recognizes that the real action in the common space are people who are pioneering, who are creating new forms of commons. And that was, this is, I mean, there may be other terms and obviously in other, other, um, Languages, maybe the, the, the word commons works much better. But for me in English, I think to say that we are commoners also reflects the importance of intention and of people. It's not about a, a resource or a phenomena out there. It's about how we relate and what our intention is. And it's the people I know in this space who've inspired me. People like Matthew who've inspired me because he's committed his whole life for the last five years to building up the software commons for community currencies. Theories would just put me to sleep. So we have to focus on the individuals and what, who we are and what we're doing. So... Um, and we have to shift the debate and we have to come up with as fancy, sexy terms as the tragedy of commons, but which actually turn that on its head. We have to talk about how we are unlocking the treasury of the commons. We must really think about how we can c communicate about what, what it is that we're doing, how we are reconnecting people to our original wealth. 
And we have to do that very fast. This is a photo from September last year, taken by NASA. The yellow line shows the average least amount of summer uh, ice in the Arctic in the 80s and 90s. So you can see from September last year, NASA found that half the ice was missing. That's a piece of ice the size of the Indian subcontinent. So also, I don't know if you saw the news recently, we've gone past 400 parts per million of carbon in the atmosphere. And we know how all the rather pathetic attempts to do anything about it called carbon trading is really stumbling now. So there's... If, if we truly believe this deep critique of the current monetary system that I presented earlier, which demands ever more turning of life itself into commodities to be traded, to generate profits, to serve this massive debt monster, then we really have to make sure that what we're doing on the commons is actually scalable and can actually be scaled quickly. In order, because otherwise, we may be all very proud of ourselves and, we, you know, and what we're doing and be very pleased with ourselves, but actually we're going to be swept away with the tide of climate change and the massive disruption that it's going to be bringing. So we must keep that bigger picture in mind. And for me, I think there's three areas, therefore, that we need to look at. One is the amazing power of new technologies to be truly disruptive to the social and economic order. Let's not forget, Twitter didn't exist seven years ago, but played a role in recent revolutions. Facebook didn't exist nine years ago. So I think, really, let's look at how we can support innovative currency types with key commons design principles, but actually could build a new generation of currencies, perhaps through distrib- not like a, a mutual credit style of, of Bitcoin, for example, and provide real alternatives, which mean we no longer have to worry about persuading politicians to listen to us. We can actually create the future ourselves and in a way which cannot be switched off. The second thing is we need allies. We need allies to achieve scale. And I think in the monetary space, those allies could be local governments. Uh, And there are amazing examples where local governments have decided to back local currencies and help facilitate them, even accept tax in them, or offer to pay uh, for local public services in them. And I think that, as well, with the pressure on many local governments' budgets, means that there could be really useful allies to be found there. And the third thing is we need a much better political voice We do have things like the Pirate Party. It's great they're here. Also, Julian Assange is running for election, and there's a sort of a WikiLeaks party starting. But we need a a, a political philosophy and a political voice in order to protect the commons and help scale it. And um, I'm really keen to hear where is that happening. Because we... No, I mean, here in Berlin, I I was here 20 years ago, the last time I was here, and as I was coming in and I realised that, of course, this place in Europe reminds us about how massive change is possible. Massive, peaceful change is possible, absolutely. Beautiful change, beautiful, peaceful, massive, revolutionary change is possible. So if you work in money, what I've realised is that it's a whole paradigm shift. And... For me, it's, it's really helped tear down the wall between this fake ideology of left and right. It tears down the wall between this false dichotomy between austerity or more borrowing and spending. It tears down the wall between us and our environment. It tears down the wall between the sense of what we truly desire and what we think we can only afford. Suddenly we realize that wealth is ours to unlock and discover and create together and we actually have to just help free each other up to do that so for me the truly revolutionary transformative potential of the commons must have monetary issues at the center of its critique analysis and proposals and that's why ludwig's session is fantastically important and you should all come along thank you